Welcome to yet another Toronto Audio Engineering Society uh, event. Show of hands, members, who are, who are the members? Non-members, I, I know who you are. I, I know who you are. Uh, thanks for coming. This was a very popular event. Uh, we're recording it because uh, this was an event that we actually got the most amount of people going, is this webcast? Is this going to be recorded? Uh, it's a very popular topic because it applies to everything. It applies to this room, it applies to uh, you know, the production facilities that we use, uh, the test facilities that we use, uh, tons and tons of applications. And that's really what we try to do with these events is make them as, not universal, I don't want to use the word universal, I don't want to use the word flexible, but the most <laughs> usable knowledge that we can share amongst uh, our, uh, our, our members. Um, before I get going here, I gotta take this time to thank our sponsors who paid for our pizza, which was our meal, which will become our snack later. <laughs> That's how pizza works. It's a snack when it's cold, it's a meal when it's warm. <laughs> So our sponsors are Gear Audio, Sono Technique, AVShop.ca, Adamson, Lawo, Solotech, and our contributing members, uh, you know, our, our host facilities, uh, Toronto Metropolitan University, and of course the University of Toronto uh, Faculty of Music, who's hosted us tonight and uh, multiple other nights uh, throughout our season. This is our second episode of the season. I'm going to call it the episode of the season. Uh, we usually do 10 episodes. I don't know, I'm going to call them episodes. Uh, every year. And uh, we are, are continuing this tradition of the Audio Engineering Society in Toronto. Uh, it's only made possible through the work of our executive committee. Uh, anyone on the executive here? Uh, yeah, we got executive. Yeah, we've got executive. We've got executive. <laughs> If you would like to contribute to these meetings, and if you've ever wondered how they work, we are an improv group, an audio improv group. <laughs> we take crazy ideas, we meld them together with other crazy ideas, and create topics such as this one. This meeting is a special one. Uh, we called it Building the Goal. Why did we call it Building the Goal? Because goals have budgets. Dreams don't. So, <laughs> so goals have budgets, dreams don't. Some dreams do, but hopefully there's a goal in there. And we really wanted to ground this in real world application, real world professionals, uh, real world experience, and real world projects. So uh, cheers to that. Would you like me to introduce our first guest, or can I just hand it over to you? Just hand it over if you wish. Okay, everyone, uh, I'm gonna introduce Angeli. Angeli is uh, the producer of our episode. <laughs> there, it's all tied it together there at the end there, Anthony. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Uh, if you're not on our mailing list, you can go to our website, subscribe to our mailing list. Uh, if you have any questions, torontoaes.org. Uh, we'll be happy to answer them uh, moving forward. So. Angelia, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, all, everyone, for coming. Anthony is the co-producer <laughs> of this episode. And um, he kept pointing in my direction with real world, real world, real world, real world, projects, goals, dreams. Oh, my gosh. Well, that's the only reason I'm actually here at the minute is because I'm in the process of building <clears throat> A home recording studio. It's an experimental, project-based uh, type of place, and yes, it is very much on a budget. It is attached to our house, but because physics principles are the same, regardless of your budget, I have we have brought in Martin Pilchner, who is the man of the globe who realizes high performance music for film and broadcast facilities, performance spaces, critical listening environments, and all manner of studios. This man has over 40 years of experience across the globe, and I'm still agog over this number. Well over 2,700 facilities to the credit of his company, Pilchner Schuster. 
right? <coughs> so we get to have somebody here who has garnered awards and recognition for engineering, acoustics, architecture, and provided the results that the contract said it needed to provide. So we are beyond honored. Uh, I don't want to say too much more because it's more important that he say what needs to be said. Martin, thank you very much for coming. My pleasure. We're so happy to have you here. Thanks. All right, for Martin, everyone. Well, it's a real honor to be here at the AES. I'm doing a little talk. Nothing better than having a captive audience. The doors are going to be locked. So no one's allowed to leave. <laughs> <laughs> We've got pizza for the siege. <laughs> um, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about, you know, this idea of a home studio and look at it, you know, as a professional studio. I think what has happened nowadays is there's a kind of a blending of those two. There's home studios that, you know, approach a personal studio, professional studio, and a little bit vice versa, depending on the context. So I thought we'd start off, first of all, by looking at that. So, question, what's the difference between a home studio and a professional studio? One makes money. Beds. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kitchen. Kitchen. Let's look at some uh, quantifiable metrics, shall we? Sure. Size. Professional studio, I'm gonna say anywhere from 500 to 20,000 plus square feet. Goes up from there. Home studio, let's call it, you know, 100 to 1,000 square feet. Is that fair? Yeah, sure. sure. Okay. Um, context. <clears throat> Professional studio, typically in a commercial building. And typically, all these different spaces are separate. Separate control rooms, separate ISO booths, separate studios, things of that nature. Uh, in the home setting, first of all, it's residential, and secondly, a lot of times, the spaces are combined. Maybe you're cutting vocals in the control room, right? You don't have a separate live room, things like that. Capability, okay. This, this is kind of related to size, if you will. Professional studio, large size, you can do ensemble recording. Yep. High room volume, which is beneficial. And you've got high ceilings, also beneficial. These are hard to get in your home studio, where you have limited population, room size, you know, doesn't hold as many people, not intended to. Limited room volume, smaller space, and almost always limited ceiling height. Unless you have, you know, 20 foot ceilings in your I'm a, no? Okay. Um, isolation. How much sound isolation do you have? In a professional studio, it's going to be high. It's going to be 80 plus 80 STC and up, depending on the context. Come for free. In a home setting, you know, it's reasonable, moderate. STC 50 plus in that area. What's STC? That's the sound transmission class, which is kind of a weighted average of how much sound goes through the wall from reasonably low end to the upper mid range. Okay. And it was kind of intended an STC rating, kind of to determine the sound isolation of offices. Okay. For music applications, it's kind of uh, a problem because it doesn't include enough of the low frequency energy in that rating. But everybody throws out STC ratings. I try to avoid it, except for tonight. And we're going to get all that on. <laughs> Turn up the bass. <laughs> um, vibration. So, you know, professional studio, you need that high level of vibration isolation. It's usually it's pretty specific floating floor designs, you know, trying to get less than 75 micrometers per uh, second squared acceleration. For a home studio, it is much more moderate, less critical. You know, anything above this area, as long as it's not too crazy, it's, it's okay. It's not as mission critical as a professional studio, so. Noise floor. How quiet is the room? Uh, for professional studio, it has to be very quiet. Between NC 
15 and NC20. We want to make sure our noise is below these curves. For a home studio, maybe there's a little bit more tolerance to having a little bit more noise in this area. There, you can have a home studio that can be very quiet. It depends on the context and it depends on a bunch of other things, but just generally speaking, that's kind of a fair assessment because with these kind of numbers, these, there's a cost attached to all those things. Uh, for a professional studio, it's usually all dedicated mechanical. It's got a separate mechanical for control room, separate mechanical for the studio, ISO booth, common areas, things like that. More often than not, in a home setting, you're trying to tie into the existing mechanical that's doing the rest of the house, right? So there's issues with that. Power. Professional studio usually have separate technical power system. Uh, isolation transformers, filtering, uh, UPS, balanced power, all these other different requirements that you have. Whereas in a home setting, you're usually just trying to tie into the existing power, which is not as clean. Weight. Hmm. Let's say let's say we're going to do a thousand square feet of studio space. How much does a professional studio weigh? And this is the low side of this figure. That thousand square feet is gonna be probably 110,000 pounds. So you gotta make sure the building you're putting it in can support that weight. Second, the other thing that we're looking at when we're putting these type of things in structural buildings so not only just looking for the ability to carry that, that weight, but we're also looking for a specific stiffness in the structure that's supporting it. Sorry, excuse me, that's, that's the floor and everything on top of it you're counting? You got to with a building, and then we're going to build the floor, and then we're going to build the walls on the floor, and then we're going to build the ceiling into that. If we add all that together for that amount of square footage to right. achieve those other parameters, that's about the weight you're at which, uh, you know, in a moderate setting, you know, 1,000 square feet, maybe 20,000 pounds. You're doing a lot less sound isolation, right? Lots less vibration isolation. Ah, oh, the cost. Professional studio, another, I, I marvel at this more often than not, but typically now it runs between 600 and $1,200 a square foot to build a professional studio. 600 a square foot kind of gets you, checks off all the technical boxes, but you're not doing anything too fancy. You want to get it fancy, it can go up and actually you can go higher than that number. Whereas, you know, in your home, you know, it costs maybe, you know, 100 to 400 a square foot. All right? If you're doing your 10 by 10 room, you know, maybe a time for the treatment and everything else is, you know, $10,000, right? Fair to say. But it can go up from there depending on how much of those technical parameters we're going after. So, cost per thousand square foot, you know, starting at about 600,000 for a professional studio. And, you know, at a thousand square feet, 100 square foot would be 100,000. That's a lot. <laughs> Never used to be that expensive, but everything's more expensive now. So, where does this money go? <laughs> uh, here's a little breakdown of a typical kind of professional studio project. Floating floor, vibration isolation is about 9% of your budget. Walls, about 7% of the budget. Ceiling systems and whatever softness you have built in the ceiling, nine and three percent. Door and window systems can be expensive. To put in a really uh, high isolated, high SDC door, like I'm thinking like IEC, Industrial Coop 6 makes a, a particular door that's STC 64. That door in Canada, by the time you ship it here, is over $25,000 for one door. Uh, windows are expensive. Acoustic treatment, 90%, millwork items. Mechanical system, about 14%. Your electrical system and your lighting, 
but another 14%. So it all gets uh, used up fairly quickly. Martin, can you pause there? So many people wanted to take pictures of that slide. Could, could we take a second for a moment to take pictures? <laughs> Teresa, did you get a good picture? <laughs> I can make the slides available for the AES members. Ah, that would be amazing. Is that, something, right in there? Is that something we can post on our, on our website afterwards, Martin, for everyone? Is that something we can post on our website? Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Oh, even Seems better. All, you know, don't, don't stress out about it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. <laughs> so I thought, you know, interesting to compare, um, you know, professional studio versus, you know, a home studio, same square footage. And you can see where the differences lie in these different mm -hmm. aspects of the build. Excuse me, what are mechanical systems referred to? Sorry? What is mechanical systems referred to? That's all your air conditioning oh, systems. Back, mm -hmm. yeah. Which, yeah, you gotta get the air in and out, you gotta get ventilation in and out, but you have to do it quietly, yep. Yep. right? So that's the tricky part. That's the expensive part. Either some separate systems or you are making sure you got enough sound isolation between the, the rooms if they're connected on the same ductwork and things of that nature. So, so, so um, for the isolate, I'm wondering for the isolate floors, is there an acoustical benefit for the room inside or is it just for the neighboring rooms? Normally, you're building that, say you're on a structural slab, like say this floor of this building. We want to separate ourselves from this building, so we're going to create this floor system that is compliant from this. We've got some kind of you know rubber or coil springs underneath that floor, all carefully balanced, and then we're building the room on top of that thing, so that ideally the only place we're connected to the building is through that compliant material. That means any vibrations in the building don't get into the room, vibrations in the room don't get into the building and everywhere else. So that's kind of the objective, but you know it's. It's not inexpensive to do that. Either you make a simple floating floor or a more complicated floating floor. Typical floating floor would probably be a six inch concrete floor on jack up isolators or something like that. And then you gotta put your cable management in it. So you got metal troughing and all the stuff that's to run through that floor. So just the prep for the floor is a big deal. So that's what drives the cost oh, of that. Sorry, I lost the slide. <laughs> wow, I lost my mind. Uh, did that answer your question? I'm, I was wondering, like, does so a floating floor obviously decouples a room, and it, it, it and and I'm wondering, does it sound any better for mm -hmm. that studio, like versus like a non like a non decoupled room? It is more for vibration isolation than sound isolation. So it's for other people. In yeah. Okay. If you know you have a solid floor and you build a lightweight floating floor, that lightweight floating floor is going to start to be part of the sound of the room. If you did a four inch thick concrete floating floor, which is kind of the standard concrete floating floor, we usually never do those because that four inch concrete slab tends to ring. Oh, wow. The six inch slabs, it's 75 pounds a square foot. It's heavy enough to get rid of that problem. Mm -hmm. So, but that also means you're putting a lot more load on the building, right? So, thank you. Yeah, ideally the floor would be inert. Yeah, and you do slide <coughs> heavier. So, key considerations for a home studio. Yeah. Understanding the ambitions. I want a home studio and I want it to do this. <clears throat> Understanding the workflow. Isolation. Background noise. The sound of the room is kind of important. And you know, the look and feel of the space. You know, are you inspired when you go into that space? Can you feel good in there? So, who's the studio intended for? First question you ask yourself, why, why am I building the studio? Who's the studio for? Me, you know, I'm a, I'm a composer. I want to just work in the studio and create my own music or are you going to do recording other people? Things like that. How many people should accommodate? Is it just me, or is it going to be a small band I want to record, or things like that? Changes the population, changes the context. 
what is the extent of the acoustic recording? You know, you can make a studio and sit there and do everything on your computer and just create electronic music and never have to worry about having a microphone in the space. If you've got to do acoustic recording, then you have a microphone in the space and you have to deal with some of the issues associated with trying to record sound in that space. What's the extent of the equipment or instruments? Okay, I got, you know, my Pro Tool system, my laptop, and I got, you know, 50 synthesizers and, you know, eight guitar rigs. Changes the size you need for the studio to accommodate all those things. And what's the extent of the monitoring? Am I working in stereo? Do I wanna do something in spatial audio? Determines, you know, how many speakers I need in the space, also drives the size of the space a bit to accommodate that. So, when it comes to workflow, who's the primary operator? Is it just me in there? doing things that the way I like to do it, or does it have to accommodate someone other than me? What's centered listening position? I'm sitting there between the speakers. Am I working mostly on my laptop? Or am I working on an analog mixer? Or am I working on a MIDI keyboard? What am I doing that I need to have in front of me while I'm listening? Most. What equipment instruments need to be nearby, right? Within arm's reach. And does the main position need to serve more than one task? We did the studio once for a client in Ohio. He wrote a lot of music for radio, but he wanted to have the desk in front of him, and then he wanted to have his computer in front of him, and then he wanted to have his keyboard in front of him. So he made this desk system on these rollers that he could just roll the desk, whatever he needed to have in front of him. It's kind of a cool idea. But most people don't do that, so you gotta, you know, think about that. So let's get into sound isolation. General rule for sound isolation. We don't talk about sound isolation. Let's <laughs> <laughs> wait for that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Mass. General, generally, you know, the more massive something is, the better is a stopping sound. So this comes down to um, the mass law, which means as things get heavier, they can stop sound better. As you go up in frequency, it can stop sound better. So, I always like to bring out a scenario, which I call the worst case scenario, where you need you know, really good sound isolation. What could possibly be the worst case? Okay, you have a heavy metal band <laughs> rehearsal unit, and they like to rehearse at 120 dB, God. and they have a lot of expletive lyrics. What is the worst thing you can put beside that? Nursery. Church. Foreign arts studio. Foreign arts space. I got a better one. <laughs> Church. Church. <laughs> a nursery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. nursery. Yeah. But wait. This is a nursery for the infant children of lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> and the background noise in the nursery is about 30 dB. So we've got 120 dB, 130. How many dB do we, does the wall have to lose? 90. 120 to 30. If we lose 90, that means the expletive lyrics is just as loud as the sound in the room. That's not good. So we have to lose more than that. We have to lose 100 dB. So let's, let's have a wall that loses 100 dB, shall we? we try it. So, uh, you know, everybody's favorite, of course, is uh, five base drywall. One layer of five base drywall. Look at this, at 500 hertz, we got 32 dB. We're practically a third of the way there, this is easy. <laughs> Let's spend twice as much money. So we're gonna go with uh, two layers of 
of drywall. <laughs> Double the cost. Yeah. Oh, well, I get 38 dB. Hmm. Okay. Let's, let's spend twice as much money again. Let's go with four layers. Now we're at 44 dB. Let's spend twice as much money again. Let's go to eight layers. We're 50 dB, we're halfway there now. Um, let's spend twice as much money again. Let's put in 16 layers of drywall. I don't recommend doing that. Uh, that is 50, 60 dB. You notice every time we're doubling the weight, we're getting 60 dB. Every time we double the frequency, we're getting 60 dB. Um, let's go to the ridiculous now. That's 32 layers, we're 62 dB. And uh, we're gonna go even more ridiculous. 64 layers of drywall, 68 dB. This isn't gonna work, is it? No. Here's the, here's the, let me tell you the downside. See this little line here, this mass law line? That's ideal. Yeah. No material behaves like that. Yeah. There's, there's modal frequencies that happen in the material that cause a dip down here. There are surface waves that happen in the material that cause a dip down here. So this is ideal. In reality, no material behaves like that. And if there's no holes cut in it. The, <laughs> if there's no holes cut in it, right? So. <clears throat> None of that. So how do we do this? Well, we start off with mass. Get some airspace and mass. So here's, here's the only thing you need to know. That's the general rule right there. You want to get sound isolation? Mass, air cavity, mass. Let me give you some examples. Let's take a regular partition, half inch drywall, wood studs, half inch drywall. What's your OC on your studs? This guy, STC 35, is not bad. Simple wall, basic wall. Here you can see the uh, resonance is down here. Here you can see with the result of, you know, surface waves in the material. What happens is dip up here, as sound energy hits a wall, it hits a coincident frequency, a kind of a frequency that that wall mass likes to vibrate and it gets a wave that travels across the surface of the wall this way at that point. These are more kind of modal behavior of the wall down here. We'll talk more about that later. But can we make that better? Sure. What if we make it heavier on either side? Well, we go from half inch drywall to five eighths inch drywall. Went from STC 35 to STC 36. That's type X drywall. Let's, uh, let's change that to type C drywall. They look all pretty much the same, right? The type C drywall gives us a little bit of performance. We'll pick up another STC point right there. How about we put insulation in the wall? Now we're jumping up to STC 42. You can see it's starting to improve down here. It's still a pretty conventional wall. Let's put in resilient channel, which is flexible metal channel, so that the two sides aren't as rigidly connected anymore. And you can see we get a pretty good improvement in putting the resilient channel in. Not a lot of improvement down here below 63, right? But what's, the, what's down there? Only base. <laughs> um, if we completely separate the walls and keep the airspace the same, that means it'd be two separate wall frames with an air gap between them. You see we pick up a little bit of performance here again now. How about if we build two completely separate walls? Two by four wall, drywall, two by four drywall. It's the same mass on either side, but we have much better airspace. Like if we're losing this kind of resonance that happens in there, we're starting to decouple these spaces, right? Let's make it heavier. Look at this, we add one layer of drywall to the one side, looks better again. 
Add a layer of drywall to the other side. That's looking, you know, reasonable. Let's make it heavier. Let's put a layer of MDF between the drywall on both sides. And, you know, uh, let's add a little bit more weight to it. We're gonna put a compliant material between the drywall sheets. We're gonna put some mass loaded vinyl between there, which is kind of a limp mass, but what that soft membrane does, it helps damp like a shock absorber that surface wave. Increases the performance. Look at this, we're at STC 81 now. We've come a long way from our irregular partition, right? <clears throat> so we, that's where we started, that's where we ended. You know, at the, at the low frequency range, we're adding about 38 dB of sand isolation. In the mid range, we're adding about 44 dB of sand isolation. And at the high end, we're adding about 47 dB of sand isolation. Hey, over here at 5 dB, you're over 100 dB of sand isolation in the high frequencies. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get down there without adding a lot more mass or maybe another wall still. Um, look at, we wanted 100 dB here. We're still off that, you know, we still have a problem with the nursery. We have more work to do. But you get an idea of how this kind of behaves and what's actually going on, right? So, next thing is, you know, we have the, uh, the sound isolation, but the trick is, you know, keeping the studio quiet. So, to be functional, studios should be capable of maintaining a low background noise. I want to uh, turn a microphone on and the thing and be able to record reasonably well. This is often challenging given the context, budget, structural constraints of a typical residential setting. Uh, I will say this, and Terry will back me up on this. Sound isolation is the single most expensive part about building a studio. <coughs> You don't need any sound isolation. Go to town. Keeping the space quiet means protecting you from unwanted external noise sources and uh, making sure there are no noise sources in the room. You know, you don't want to have um, fans, things like that running in the room. <coughs> You know, in the earlier days, this we're just kind of let, what led to having separate machine rooms in a professional studio. So it's trying to get all this machine noise out of the room so you can get that no background noise. This kind of coincided with, you know, the beginning of digital audio recording too, where you had way more ability to record dynamic range. In an old analog studio, you know, you didn't need to have that quiet of background noise. NC25, pretty normal. So mechanical noise. Isolated studio space requires air circulation for temperature, humidity, control, and ventilation. Agreed? Yes. We can't make this perfectly well isolated sealed box that you should only be in for maybe half an hour before you have to go out and you know, get fresh, fresh air. Or, or not. I feel tired. Uh, so this usually means we build this isolated box, everything's perfect. Okay, now let's cut a bunch of holes in it so we can get the air in and out of it. That's not good. Despite the holes, we must maintain the sound isolation. This implies the openings should be protected and provide insertion loss. That means I gotta be able to put ductwork in, I gotta protect that ductwork, and I gotta make sure I get enough sound attenuation in the ductwork so that protection can do its job over a certain distance. So we can't just connect sheet metal ductwork to the room because we only have the sound isolation as good as the sheet metal. So imagine we have this multi-layer vibration isolated box and then we're going to connect sheet metal ductwork up to it seal up to the ductwork it's all good but that hole in the wall is only as good now as the sheet metal let me give you an interesting statistic if you have a six foot thick concrete wall between this room and this room maybe this is our rehearsal unit this is our nursery we're going to have good sound isolation that's a lot of mass there if 5% of that wall is open from one side to the other, it's only 3 dB better than having no wall. 
Air Seal is an absolute killer. It's amazing how much sound travels through a small space. Uh, so, getting back to our ducks. Think about that now. <laughs> Um, duck cork should have enough absorption to reduce the noise from the air handler. So we got the air handler making noise. If we connect regular sheet metal duct work to it, like in a house, well, all the duct work in your house just plain sheet metal. That sheet metal has duct work has an attenuation of 0.1 dB per foot. That means every foot of that duct work, the decibel is only it's only about 0.1 dB. Every 10 feet, it's dropping only 1 dB. It is actually an excellent intercom system for your house. <laughs> you just, you know, you wanna just yell in the duct and so people can hear you through the rest of the house. That's hooked up to our home studio and you know, everybody can hear what we're doing. Or we can also hear the air handling furnace kicking in and all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. So we need to provide enough sound attenuation in the duct work. So if you're doing it in your house, you're gonna have all the duct work for the house, but when you're making those connections to the studio, you have to now put in special plenum silencers or special line ductwork to give you that insertion loss between the house and the studio. There's a bunch of interesting products that you need that, that even just are made to fit up between your floor joists that you can use as silencers. I think Kinetics makes some of those products. Um, ductwork either lagged externally or special bulkheads are built. So, if I connect a piece of duct work up, and let's say it's internally lined, I've got my sound attenuation, I'm not hearing the air handler unit, but if it's just a sheet metal, I have to worry about sound breaking in and out of that sheet metal. So what I could do is I could lag the outside of that duct, which means I'm adding something heavy to the outside of it. Typically it would be some type of insulation, some layer of you know heavy membrane of, uh, of neoprene and then more insulation, or it might actually be wrapped with multiple layers of drywall. Right, so I can protect the noise from breaking at least a, a good amount of distance so that the absorption in the duct can do its job. So that's lagging the duct work. If you're building a studio, you can also just build these bulkheads into the floor plan. So you're building this box and then you're building these boxes inside and these are all, you know, all acoustically lined and these, you know, the duct work come in here but the air is coming out over here, here and here. So we're getting all the insertion loss this, this opening here doesn't make its way directly out there and vice versa. So the, all the openings are protected by the use of these bulkheads, which can be an architectural feature or what have you, but they serve an important purpose in solving the mechanical problem. So insertion loss is calculated by taking the air handler noise. Let's just run you through it. We would take something like, uh, we have an air conditioner, or the air handler unit making a certain amount of noise. We we'll plug in the noise down here. And then we look at what's happening, the size of the room, the, the acoustic conditions of the room, how far is our listening point away from the nearest terminal, right? All those things are factors that determine what we're hearing here in the room. And then we work through this thing, starting with this level here. You know, every time we have a certain amount of line duct, <clears throat> how much attenuation we get per foot. Every time we're changing size of the ducts, branch ducts, elbows, all this stuff adds in, and we can reduce the amount of noise that the air handler is making. So in this case here, this was the noise of the air handler. Pretty quiet unit to begin with. Uh, and this is what was our target NC. And when I put all these pieces of the ductwork together, that's our expected noise level inside that control room. Right? So this is what's called like an insertion loss calculation. You're calculating how much sound attenuation you're getting through that path. You do it for supply and the return. Because it travels both ways. And a lot of the air handler data, they'll give you the, the uh, sound power level across the spectrum for the uh, supply and return side of the unit. So these things got properly measured with an intensity probe so that you can plug it into here and know what you're doing. Um, the other thing you ought to worry about if you have duct work that's coming from air handler and it's connecting to this studio and it's also connecting to the ISO booth and you want to get a good amount of sound isolation between the studio and the ISO booth, what you don't want is to have a short duct path between those because now the weak link is the short duct path, right? Which doesn't have the same attenuation that your wall system has, right? So you always got to be mindful of what's going where. Ah, environmental noise. Noise from external sources. Um, I'm sure, we've been asked this question many times. Somebody says, yeah, 
I found this old church that I want to make into a studio. Right? Okay, that's great. We're going to love the vibe of the church and everything. Okay, first question is, you know, do we, do we hear the rain in the roof? Or do we hear the streetcars? Do we hear planes? Do we hear, you know, trucks going by? What is the isolation rating of that building? Because if it's not there, what's your alternative? is to build a box inside that space, which kind of ruins the vibe of the space, right? Same thing applies to um, home studios and every measure. I had an interesting uh, problem. I was called by a client in, in Winnipeg, and they, they built a pretty elaborate studio. And um, they were fans of Steve Albini, who was sadly passed away, brilliant engineer. Right? And they got Steve to design their studio. S Steve is a great engineer. I don't think he's designed a lot of studios other than Electric Audio, which is a studio he had in Chicago. So, studio's all done. Pretty vibe, pretty cool. And then they call, yeah, we're hearing the planes in the studio. We're hearing the bus go by. We're hearing the other studio. And we can feel the transformer in the floor. They said, okay, so we looked at it. The control room had a floating floor, but all the studios were just built on that warehouse floor and had the exposed warehouse ceiling. Mm. So in that case, you actually want to put that isolated box where you're gonna have the microphones open, not the other way around. So then it was like, okay, how do we add that stuff after the fact now to try to get back to where we wanna be? Um, So professional studios go to great lengths to mitigate these sources, which may not always be possible in a residential setting, right? For a number of those reasons we've already kind of <coughs> touched upon. There's less risk posing a problem in a residential setting than a big studio. Imagine you've got a studio full of session players and you know, you're dealing with unwanted noise. That's not acceptable because it costs a lot of money to redo things do takes, all that kind of stuff. So um, there's a much higher risk in a professional studio than in a residential setting. Okay, we're gonna do that take again, you know? Everybody with me still? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you tell them there's a quiz after this, right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, adjacencies. Both commercial and home studios require diligence when considering adjacent spaces. What sits beside what? Generally speaking, don't put quiet spaces next to noisy spaces, like our rehearsal unit and the nursery. Right? Uh, other thing to think about, you know, the studio is both a quiet and a noisy space. You want to protect it about noise coming in, but in a lot of cases, especially in a home studio, you want to protect other people in the house from when you're operating at elevated levels in that space. Careful planning can leverage neutral spaces between critical adjacents to achieve significant sound isolation. Let me give you an example. We did a studio in Pennsylvania, multi-room facility, and we had a big control room, and it shared a large live room, and then we had another control room on the other side and we want to be able to leverage any of those spaces any way we want. So the big control room can track in the large studio, and then for mixing in that large studio, the small studio can track in the big thing, and we don't want any interference between those spaces, which means the amount of sound isolation you need to have is incredibly high, which is hard to do, as we know. Want me to tell you what I did? Yes. Can you keep a secret? Yes. Okay, I'll tell you. Control room, and uh, I'll tell you, the, the, let me just tell you the end result. That control room had uh, in wall 5.1, 412 quested monitors, big monitors, double 18 subs. You could take that at basically full scale, super loud in the control room, over 120 dB. And then you walk out and you can stand in front of the window in the studio and hear nothing. That's what you want. 
Same thing the other way. So we have the control room. Inside glass of the control room, one inch laminated glass. Then a foot of airspace, three quarter inch laminated glass. Then a secondary hallway, about five feet. And then another three quarter inch piece of laminated glass. And then another one inch laminated glass inside the studio. So that mass and that amount of airspace gives you ability to decouple that energy enough times so that it doesn't find its way into other space. That's, you know, leveraging neutral spaces. But, you know, if you have this noisy space and you have a quiet space, you know, is, can you have something else in between it that can act as a buffer, right? That's how you got to think about it. Room sound quality. So a number of things you know we can look at at a you know simple level of what what affects the sound quality of the space, and um, these will all sound familiar. Frequency of the sound acts like as a wave, basically the omnidirectional wave in the space, and at the mids and higher frequencies it becomes geometric, it starts to act like a ray, it's directional. You know if you take a speaker, turn it on, stand in front of the speaker, stand behind the speaker, you hear just as much bass. In front of the speaker, you're hearing the high end, but back of the speaker, you're not, right? So, this crossover point between these two different behaviors is kind of uh, identified by what's called the Schroeder frequency, which is 2,000 times the square root of the reverb time divided by the volume. When you consider some of these psychoacoustic effects, um, the shorter frequency typically lands between 150 and 300 hertz, but when you consider some of the psychoacoustic effects and how we hear, uh, we generally assume 400 hertz down is that behavior, 400 hertz up is the other behavior. So speaking of the lower behavior, that is where we have to consider room modes. So also known as standing waves or modal resonances, collection of resonant frequencies that occur in the room due to its dimension and shape. So we have a room of a certain size, there's going to be a wavelength that fits in this dimension. Where that wavelength fits this, it's going to create a very specific pressure pattern this way. It's going to have, at that frequency, a hole right here in the middle. At two times that frequency, it's going to have two holes. They're going to be over there and there. At three times that frequency, there's going to be three holes. One there, one in the middle again, one over there, one over there, and so on. It's called the mode index, like which harmonic we're talking about, how many cancellation points you have in that particular direction. Um, so the wavelength specific frequency coincides with the room dimension, standing wave is created, standing wave results in a specific pressure pattern in the room where the sound is louder or quieter as you move spatially. So every notice in a small room you're hearing a low frequency, all of a sudden it seems to disappear in a certain part of the room. That's what's going on. Don't worry about this in a large space. Concert hall, they don't have to worry about that because that fundamental frequency is so low. By the time it gets up in the audible spectrum, there's enough harmonics, it starts to fill itself in. But in a small space, like a studio, it is a, a bit of a concern. So if we look at what these pressure patterns look like, here's some examples. This is kind of so this longitudinal noise front to back, where one wavelength fits in here, we have that cancellation, that, that null point in the middle. And this green and red is kind of the compression rarefaction of the wave. So these things just toggle back and forth. But in the middle, you've got that cancellation point. That's the fundamental of the width. This is the second harmonic of the length. This is a combination of the fundamental of the width combined with the fundamental of the length. This is, oh, where is it? I'm look at this. That's the fundamental of the height. Because it happens every direction. It happens this way, it happens this way, it happens this way. So, modes of vibration occur in each direction at the fundamental frequency and its harmonics. A well isolated room. So now we spend all the money on the sound isolation and we've got this heavy, well isolated box. It's actually going to be more than that. In a really well isolated room, that untreated box imagined, that hole in the middle will be 30 dB. Really? You'll just 30 be like, what? It's going on, like, okay, I can hear it here, I can hear it here, I get here, it's like, it is basically gone. If you have your home studio 
and you don't have that much sound isolation, that problem isn't as big. Because if you're hearing the bass outside of your studio, that's a bass that's no longer inside the room. <laughs> so at the very low frequencies, your studio looks a lot bigger, right? But if you put sound isolation in, it uh, puts a lot more demand on the uh, acoustic treatment. So small rooms behaviors, uh, yeah, so I talked about this, you know, between large and small spaces. So if we look at, you know, the Schroeder frequency, this modal behavior is all happening down here. This is what's affecting this low end response. Um, so for a typical studio, mode distribution is examined from 300 hertz down. We're looking from 300, what's happening below 300 hertz modally in the space? That's what we're interested in. That lowers range. How good a room is at low frequencies is related to the distribution of the modal fundamentals and harmonics. Let me just get to that. Okay, I'm throwing a lot of stuff out yet. I'm going to try to make it make sense in a second. The number of room modes should increase with the frequency exponentially. So if we start at the low end and we count how many modal frequencies we have, they should continuously increase. We're looking for that kind of behavior. And hopefully they're not too spaced apart. What you don't want to have is a bunch of mode frequencies that are piled up, and then a big hole, and then a bunch of them are piled up, and a big How do you do that? Well, easy. Let's make a room that's, say, 15 feet deep by 15 feet wide. I don't know, 15 feet high. This axial mode is the same frequencies as that axial mode. It's the same frequencies as this axial mode, and now they all start piling up, right? which is frowned upon. <laughs> <laughs> so any buildups or gaps in the frequency distribution highlight potential problems. So if you look at the response of a room versus the distribution of these modes, where you have these buildups, you'll see that there's actually buildup of energy in the room at that point. So three basic types. This, uh, this is like, you know, just so you have an idea. Ixian modes are one-dimensional modes. They happen between pair of surfaces. There's a mode that fits this way. There's a mode that fits this way. There's a mode that fits this way. Uh, next to that would be tangential modes. These are two-dimensional modes that happen in these two directions, or these two directions, or these two directions. So involving four surfaces. They're generally weaker than an axial mode. These are stronger in terms of their contribution to that resonant response to the room than these. And last but not least, we have oblique modes, which are three-dimensional modes involving you know, all three directions, six surfaces, if you will. So the ideal modal distribution would be something, like I said, that looks like this. Constantly getting more and more and more. This falls what's called Bonello distribution, uh, which is a way of looking at the frequency spacing statistics of where these modal frequencies exist. All these resonances happen, right? There's fundamentals, they are all there, right? So what we're trying to do is get them to line themselves up in a very behaved way and not to pile up in certain places. So how do we do that? This is typically done by adjusting the room dimensions. Let's find, you know, an aharmonic relationship between these three dimensions where nothing is, you know, similar to the other direction other dimensions so that a lot of work was done examining room ratios starting out with uh, Richard Bolt actually in 1939 published his first papers on frequency spacing statistics of eigentones in rectangular spaces great paper Great paper. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Uh, you know, I, I got to tell you a little backstory. On, anybody ever hear of Richard Bull? Just now. You ever heard of uh, Leo Baranek? Yeah. Yeah. How about John von Neumann? Yes. Yeah. yes. John von Neumann he was the guy that decided early on that computers would be more efficient if they had memory and if you moved information in parallel. So, Bull. Baranak and Neumann had a company where they figure stuff out for people. One of their missions in the 60s, starting at the beginning of the 60s, was figuring out how you have mainframe computers 
talk to each other in a way that if one of those mainframe computers disappeared, it wouldn't lose any information. They successfully had that running in 1969. It was called the ARPANET, mm -hmm. which you now call the internet. That's these guys. And <coughs> both Baron and Ike also designed Roy Thompson Hall. So, a little backstory. So, this whole idea of acceptable room ratios, you know, an exhaustive study was done by Trevor Cox at Salford University. And this is a pretty famous uh, way of looking at what are good room ratios. In this case, on this chart, you know, width to height ratio is a factor here, and the length to height ratio a factor there. Um, rooms in this area are typical rooms that have similar dimensions that are not good. So they actually have this tool available for free. All you have to do is download the Dolby Dart, which is a Dolby design tool for their Atmos rooms. And if you go into that and you click on acoustic analysis, you're going to be able to get all these cool tools. They kind of reworked it like this, clipped it around so that it includes this little area here, which is, you know, Back. Back. <laughs> uh, this little area here, which is you know the Dolby acceptable Dolby. Dolby room ratios. This is free. Yeah. So I know you can work these things out, you know, by dividing the speed of sound and the length of the room and so on. But all this stuff it implies that your ceiling and your floors are all the same. Like you. you they're parallel. What happens when you're in a home studio and you've got an L-shaped room or you have ceiling that slopes and things like that? It becomes more complicated. <laughs> is there a program you can use to figure that out? I'll tell you what, you know, there's a uh, control room design theory called Live and Dead End. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Well, the, one of the features of a Live and Dead End room is it actually had two, two rooms. It had an outer room, which was an asymmetrical outer shell, and then it had a symmetrical inner shell. That inner shell would cross over to the outer shell at the Schroeder frequency. But the outer shell was asymmetrical. It was deliberately, and that was the sound isolated low frequency barrier. It would be deliberately made like this. Because what you would do is you'd have a standing wave at this frequency, and then it would spread out evenly to a standing wave at this frequency. If you do the same this thing, you'd spread out the modal frequencies in that way, and same thing in the ceiling. If you did this, it spreads out those modal resonances over a range of frequencies, it tends to smooth out the bottom end of response. Mm -hmm. uh, right? That was the idea behind it. So it's a good thing. Uh, rectangular box is really easy to understand how it behaves, though. Right, right. That's the advantage of a rectangular box. There's no surprises. Not as many surprises. Um, so a typical modal frequency, I did a little calculation. Let's take a, what I consider to be a you know, typical home studio. We're going to have 17 foot length for the space, 11 feet wide, 8 foot ceiling. Um, what we see in the modal distribution, here's where the axial modes are, here's where the tangential modes are, here's are where the oblique modes are. Um, another way to look, oh, sorry, I'm rearranging the place. Um, another way to look at it is what is the space between the modes? So here's a little statistical analysis of what is the spacing between the modes. These yellow dots being the average spacing between the HCL, tangential, and oblique modes. Another way of looking at it. Uh, this kind of gathers it up. This kind of follows, you know, Bonello criteria. Bonello said, you know, like an easy way to understand the distribution and see if it's good or not would be to break up the low end spectrum in third octaves from 20 to 200 and then just count how many modes you have in each third octave band. What you want to see is every third octave band increasing. He says, rule number one, every third octave band should be higher than the previous band. Rule number two, disregard rule number one because you can have the same number of modes in an increasing band, but you can never have less, right? You can never have less, that's the key thing. And rule number three, uh, you can have two modes at the exact same frequency if there are at least five modes in that third octave band. As long as you satisfy those rules, it's a good room. This room here is almost good. You see here at the 31.5, we have this thing, we have a hole here at 40. 
So this would kind of show up. And you can see it sitting down here. Because at the load, we just don't have um, enough modes. And as the room gets smaller than this, these things start to come up farther in the frequency band, right? They show up here. So these gaps would be higher up. So here's what you gotta look at. This is another way of looking at it. Remember when we looked at you know this cancellation point right there in the middle? Well, we can map all this stuff out. It's, it's a knowable thing. So here's just you know straight math calculation. Given this room size up here, um, in the length, eight and a half feet from the front, I basically have that fundamental hole. In the width, 5.5 feet from the side wall, I have a hole. And in the height, at four feet high, I have a hole. Where's your ear height in a room when you're sitting? 46 to 48 inches. Guess where you're sitting? You're sitting right in that fundamental hole in the vertical mode. So you got to do something about that. Uh, as you can see here, when we go here, this, if we go that two times that frequency, we're going to have a hole here and a hole here. A three times that frequency, a hole here, a hole here, a hole here, and a four times that frequency. So this just shows you where in the room in those various dimensions this occurs. There's a version of this on that Dolby Acoustic Analysis tab too, which is handy. Because let's say we're, we're, we want to lay out the room. Where do I not want to put the listening position? So if I'm looking at the length, let's look at the length because it'll be easier. I want that listening position to not be there. I want it to be here somewhere. Yeah. Where do I want to put the speaker? I don't want to put the speaker anywhere near those things. And I don't want to put the listening position anywhere near those. So it's kind of a handy guide, right? <coughs> so what this looks like when you energize the room, that's pink noise. I do like really excellent uh, test signal impersonations. <laughs> I know for that. Uh, pink noise, energize the room, equal energy per octave. Shut off the noise. We're looking at the decay of the sound in the room. Where you have these resonances, they will ring out in the room. The room basically likes those frequencies. It's going to ring out a little longer. Interesting thing happens if you are playing a program content in a room with those conditions, and the you have energy in the program that's near that frequency. As it's decaying into that resonant response, what can happen is your program can actually shift frequency to the modal frequency on the tail end. It's actually change pitch because of the modal resonance, which is frowned upon. <laughs> uh, now the bandwidth of the mode is also related to the reverb time, typically 2.2 divided by the reverb time. It tells you the bandwidth of the mode. So, boundary interference. Ever, ever hear boundary interference? Speaker's an omnidirectional source. This is the speaker right here. It's radiating high frequency, low frequency that way. It's also radiating low frequency this way. Just as much, as a matter of fact, low frequency going this way as going that way. That low frequency energy is hitting that boundary. It's bouncing off that boundary and it's arriving later in time over there and because of this position, it's going to cause cancellation. Um, what's the effect that the boundary has? I, I, I don't worry about putting it in here. Years ago. I got the same uh, one. Are you talking about this? Yeah, yeah, I got my <laughs> You know how a tape measure works, right? <laughs> Years ago, Genelec came out with this tape measure, and it's not in inches and feet or you know meters. It's actually in frequencies. So you can, you know, okay, my speaker is this far from the wall where I'm going to get that cancellation dip. Wow. Wow. I'm passing mine around, Martin. Somebody, somebody nah. sure I get back. <laughs> That's his. That's mine. Um. <laughs> so, boundary interference would kind of look like this. 
Right? All of a sudden, I come out, I got this hold and response. And then you know what happens? You move the speaker position, okay, and it gets better or, or worse, hopefully better, right? By just changing the physical position of the speaker to the room boundaries. Um, here's some example calculations. Uh, let's say we have the woofer. We're interested in the woofer position, by the way, because this is a low frequency problem. Remember, we're talking about a low frequency, high frequency problem? This is a low frequency problem. Modal. Boundary, low frequency problem. Uh, if, we, if the woofer is one foot from one surface, one foot from another surface, one foot from the other surface, don't do that. It would look like this. One boundary interference would look like this. When I'm only considering one boundary, it looks like that. When I'm considering two boundaries interacting, I'm looking at that. When I consider all three boundaries interacting, I'm looking at that. I don't know, would you mind having like a 12 dB hole at 330 hertz in your speaker response? That's not a good position then. Uh, let's go a little farther away. Five feet, five foot, five foot. Here you can see, it starts to settle down up here as you get further away from the surface, but this, this fundamental drops down on a three boundary interference. So now at about you know 70 hertz, you're only a 10 dB hole at 70 hertz. Is that a problem? <laughs> now, if you can put the speaker flush into the wall, you ever see that in a studio? Mm -hmm. It's actually a good idea. <laughs> When you put that speaker flush on the wall, if I have a speaker here and I introduce a boundary here that is low frequency boundary and I confine this energy on this side of the wall, I get 3 dB more energy. Hmm. If I now bring another boundary in here and I confine the energy to this quarter now, I double it again, I get another 3 dB of energy. And if I bring another boundary here, and confine the energy into this one eighth of that original sphere, I get another 3 dB. So when you put the speaker flush into the wall, you get gain at low frequencies. So here's your speaker response in an adequate chamber. Here's your frequency response mounted flush in the wall. Is that good? Low end? Hi, is that good? Base. It seems like I got too much bass now. Yeah, too much. Is it just me? <laughs> yeah, too much. But that's okay. This is very well behaved. We can put a filter on that, or just a, just a low end amplifier or weather, and bring that gain down, because now the room is very efficient at reproducing low frequencies. If I can do that, I'm not driving the speaker as hard, I'm not driving the amplifier as hard, I have less distortion. Right. It's a good thing. and. You know, depending on the size of the speaker, that extra efficiency can add low end to the ability of the speaker to reproduce sound. Actually, can extend the low end range of it because it can do it more easily. So that's a good thing, but that's very well behaved. So some of those other ones where you see all that interaction because of the dissimilar or similar dimensions. Let's look at this one. This is you know this is pretty manageable. This one. Let's say it's you know four feet off the floor, two feet from the front wall, three feet from the side wall. That seems pretty doable. Mm -hmm. That's actually not bad. Look at it. Give me a little dip here, you know, about three dB at 110 hertz. That's not bad. Look at it. We're picking up a lot of gain here at the bottom end. So if you ever notice on any kind of modern speaker, active speaker, there's a bunch of controls on the back that say bass roll up or bass tilt. Those controls are there for this situation. When it's close to a room boundary, because then you can actually roll this off on the speaker and get to where you want to be. So, specular reflections. So, specular reflections occur when sound waves have a smooth surface, flat surface, reflect off an angle of incidence, equal angle, angle of Instance equal angle reflection, much like a mirror. If you want to, in fact, if you want to find you know, any reflective surfaces in your room, you put a mirror on that surface and see if you can see the speaker. If you see the speaker, there's a good chance that's a reflection path. 
Here is an example of you know a room speakers mounted on the front wall. You're seeing you know the side wall reflections that are crossing the listening position. These reflections can cause constructive and deconstructive interference leading to peaks, dips in the frequency response at the listening position. It can result in certain frequencies being overly emphasized or diminished, affecting the overall balance of the sound. <coughs> we don't want those, just to be clear. So we have this thing called the reflection mask thresholds, a level of difference required for reflection to, for reflection to be masked. So how much do I have to knock that reflection down to not hear it? Uh, interestingly, in an anechoic chamber, which there are zero reflections, you, you introduce one reflection, uh, it's a 50 B difference. That one reflection gets really, really noticeable. In a typical room, it's about 20 dB, because we have a lot more reflections going on here. Um, the more isolated the reflection, the more noticeable. Um, this is kind of sometimes happen. I'm sure you'll attest to this, Terry. You, know, you got a room, you start going after specular reflections, and you get rid of the reflections, all of a sudden some other reflection shows up even more noticeable than before. Because <coughs> when they're all in the room, you didn't notice that one as much, but you start taking the other ones out, all of a sudden that other reflection shows up more readily. The closer reflecting surface, typically the higher in level. Reflecting surface, uh, reflection of the surface is twice as far. Directive energy <coughs> would only be minus 60 dB, minus any surface attenuation we have. But in a bigger space, that reflection travels a longer path, a little easier to deal with. In a smaller space, you're not closer to these room boundaries, all right? The room reflections are more profound. So for mineral interference, a good practice to ensure that the specular reflections are at least minus 15 down from the direct energy. So you here see a, an energy time curve. This is sound leaving the speaker, sound arriving at the listening position, and then it's traveling past the listening position, and then we have reflections coming back in the room over here. It's the level of these reflections that we want to be mindful of. We want to make sure they're down at least 15 dB. Or more. If this is a higher reflection up here, this will start to show up in the frequency domain. It'll absolutely show up in the frequency response. Decay time. What am I talking about when I talk about decay time? Reverb. We, we call it reverb time, right? Reverberation. I like to call it decay time in a small space because we don't have enough reflection density to be this uniform decay of energy that statistically would be called a reverb. In a smaller room, we have a bunch of you know more discrete reflections that decay in time. Uh, for larger space with more room volume, the decay time is longer. Here's like a you know, classic chart showing different types of spaces based on volume, what you know, the target decay time is reverb time of those spaces. Um, for a you know, large space having a longer low frequency decay than a mid-high frequency decay, as to the warmth perception of the space, which is desirable for performance. Look at uh, Royal Albert Hall. Look at the reverb time of the low end versus the mid-range. Kennedy Center. Symphony Hall, Boston. Carnegie Hall is an outlier. But generally, you know, this extended uh, reverb time at low frequencies is a desirable thing in a, in a large scale performance space. Um, in a small space, long decay affects the modulation transfer function. Wow, that sounds complicated. You ever hear that? Yes. Modulation transfer function. Imagine I got a, a signal with a bunch of modulation to it and I do it in little bursts. And then I'm playing that signal through the system, through the electroacoustics of it. It's going through the speaker. It's affected by the speaker's ability to recreate that waveform. It's affected by the resonant aspects of the room to carry that waveform. And to a certain degree is affected by the microphone that picks it up. So when I compare what I ended up with to what the signal that went in was the comparison of those two signals, right? 
So if you have, if you look at this being the amount of modulation that you want to be able to express, if you have long reverb time, it starts to fill in the room with energy that allows you to not hear that. So typically in a studio space, we're looking for shorter values and a, you know, a better modulation transfer function. So we're looking for a 0.7 and up. So there are established target criteria for these types of spaces. Oh, what's this? Look at it. this is available on the Dolby Dart in the uh, acoustic analysis tab. You put your room size in in the spreadsheet, you go to this tab, your room size will already scale these things based on your room size. So, you know, ITU recommendations would fit in here. The Dolby value is in there. So our decay time, our reverb time, should sit between these values. And it's reasonably short. 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds. Um, for studio space, generally, the more uniform the decay, the better. So, ideally, you'd have you energize the room, pink noise, you shut it off, and the room should basically shut off at the same time between the high and the low end. So the reverb decay is very uniform from the top end to the bottom end. That's in a perfect world. Virtually never happens. There's always a little bit of offset in the bottom end. It requires an exceptional amount of damping to get that low frequency absorption that you need. Supplies decay time similar between low frequency, mid frequency, high frequency, all relatively short. So somewhere in here, you see there's kind of a, they allow you to have a little bit more low end reverb time in both of those standards. Where does flutter echo? What is flutter echo? Where does flutter echo come? Flutter echo is uh, is a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> flutter echo happens is when you have parallel surfaces that are reflective, and you go yes, and you're <laughs> you're actually hearing it bouncing back and forth. Yeah. It's just continuous bouncing between. That's you know it's not a good thing in the studio. Frowned upon. Wait, just, we just had this problem at. Uh, we worked on this, uh, one of the studios at WWE, and they were, one studio was just for a psych. And I said, we gotta make sure that the psych has no parallel surfaces in it. That's the way it is, all the drawings. And then they decided to buy the psych from some manufacturer, and all they make is 90 degree corners. As a wraparound psych, so that's not gonna work. <laughs> so sure enough, they build this psych like this, and then they can't do any dialogue in here. They go, sound bossing back in the psych. So we had the, you know, first of all, the company that makes this like doesn't make an 85 degree corner. So there's a business opportunity for somebody, you know, if you want to make 85 degree site corners, there's, you know, there's demand for it. So we had to actually saw off this thing, you rebuilt that leg of the site and it's a problem solved. Another one, don't tell anybody, but we did this one studio and this side, I had this glass tilting in like this. And on this side, I had glass tilting in like this. They're not parallel but I had sound bouncing from this last off the middle of the floor to this last back and last like. Oh, tennis. <laughs> oh, sound goodness. tennis. So, you know, it's just, uh, let's put a rug there. <laughs> <laughs> For the drum kit, put something there, it's gonna break that up. <laughs> Never did that again. Um, so to achieve this, you know, we it involves getting a good amount of low frequency absorption in the room. Typical absorbers, as you know, put in a typical studio absorbers, a bunch of you know, sculptured foam or acoustic panels. They like to sell you a one inch panel, fabric cover is pretty cheap. These are all great high frequency absorbers and do virtually nothing at the low frequencies. So the battle is, that's so the high frequencies, that's easy. The real work happens at the low frequency range, getting the amount of attenuation you need, the amount of sound absorption. Uh, this is an interesting one, you know, when comparing, you know, a professional studio to a home studio. There's just certain things that are not achievable in a home studio. And these are driven entirely by size. 
You know, in a modern professional control room, it should provide primarily direct energy. We are in just direct energy from the speakers. And then we have an ITD gap. So we have a gap between the direct energy and where the room reflections come in. Why is that gap important? That gap is important because, um, let's say you have a studio and somebody's in the studio and you have a vocalist singing to the microphone, but that vocal is also traveling past the microphone. It's hitting the boundaries of the studio, coming back to the microphone with a time delay. If you don't have that gap in your control room, the control room starts to introduce reflections way before you heard the studio reflections. So you're hearing that vocal as it would sound in that room, the control room. You're not hearing the vocal as it's actually sounding in the studio space. So you're actually in the control room not hearing what's going to the recording device because the control room's masking it. If you can create that time delay gap, you have the opportunity to hear these reflections that are happening in the studio and those reflections in the content mask the sound of the control room. So this is kind of one of the fundamental ideas of a live and dead end control room. Um, so if you look at a large control room, it's a fairly large control room, a little you know, Atmos room. This is the ETC of that room. This is the direct energy. Here we have this gap, the ITD gap. And here we have the reflected energy coming off the back surface of the room, you know, 15 dB down, decaying down there. So, in a small room, this is like a home studio. You can see because the back wall surface and things are closer, you see where that energy starts to come in much sooner, mm -hmm. right? So, these are just, you know, the virtue of having the ability to have that size and volume. So to achieve that, you, know, you need about 12 to 15 feet of distance behind the mix position. Is that even with a diffuser? Sorry. Can you fix that with a diffuser? Diffuser. Yeah, uh, diffuser's not gonna make it show up later. No, it's no. gonna spread it out. Here's the problem with diffusers. I love diffusers. <laughs> I think I even have a t-shirt that says that. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, like a reflection phase grading type diffuser. Those things, you know, take a wave front, they break it up the little wavelets, and then they'll, they'll lay in the wavelets, they come out and they recombine with a new wave front that's got equal energy in all directions, right? For that to happen requires a certain amount of distance from the diffuser. So you have to be at least six feet away from that diffuser to even start to benefit from the diffuser. If you have a small studio and you put a bunch of diffusers behind your head within proximity, you're gonna hear the diffuser you're gonna hear the phasiness coming off that surface because it hasn't been able to reconstruct a diffuse sound field yet. So. Works great in a bigger space though. So, look and feel in the creative act. Anybody read uh, Rick Rubin's book? Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. I, I borrowed that from uh, design and meaning. This area where we, we're going to branch off into the more, you know, architectural theory, if you will. Who is the space intended to serve? I try to think, okay, who's going to be in that space? And how can you make that space great for that person? Here's the thing. Here's the point of contention I have. If you look uh, up the name, what, what studio means? Studio comes from Latin, meaning workplace of artists. This is a place where an artist can go and they can feel creative. In my mind, what a studio should be should be that space for an artist, where they go in that space, they feel better in that space than they feel anywhere else. The real sign of success of a studio is if someone's in that space and they don't want to leave. Mm -hmm. Right? I feel like there's like something about it, you know, the phenomenology of that space. That's what studio design is about. All the technical stuff that's a given. Here's where the journey is, figuring this part out. And you know, what that is, is gonna be different for all of us, to a certain extent. It's finding out what can we, what common things tie it all together. Um, the constituent and the transitory. So in other words, you know, what, when you design something that has meaning and truthfulness 
it's going to serve that purpose now. Ten years from now, it's going to still have the same meaning and value. Something that's transitory is something that ten years from now is irrelevant. Um, it's a truthful feature or is it a gimmick? Right. Now, we're all guilty of this to a certain extent, putting colored LED lighting strips and things. Okay? It's got to stop. I hold myself accountable too. I've, I've done it. But you know, I see like all these pictures of studios, and I was like, okay, how many colored lighting strips can I put in this? And uh, what purpose is that for? It looks really cool now, but in two years from now, is it going to be cool? Or when you're in there all day long with those lighting strips in your bait, are you going to want to stay in that room? Or are you going to shut all that stuff off? Right? Perceptual tools. What tools do we have? You know what's funny to me? Is you can look at a piece of art or some kind of photography and you can get an emotional reaction to it based on what that content is in that very flat two-dimensional format without a lot of things. And then, you know, here we have the opportunity to design a, a, a complete environment with all these tools. More often than not, we fail at it. How many, you know, really great pieces of architecture have you experienced? Where you all of a sudden, you're in the space, you just realize there's something going on, you don't even know what it is, but you just feel different in that space. So, we should be able to do that in a three-dimensional way, easier than being confined to two dimensions, right? So, what do we got? Composition. You know, how we combine things and proportion it, that can be like really an interesting, powerful thing. Um, materiality, right? The, how these materials connect together. One thing that I uh, find offensive is fake materials. Yeah, I want to, you know, I have a floor that's, you know, a ceramic tile, but it looks like hardwood. So you're lying. If, it, if you want it to look like hardwood, make it actually real hardwood. It's got like a completely different feel and value to it, right? Big materials, you know, uh, they fall into the, uh, the gimmick area. We don't want that. If you use real materials, honest materials, they will always be true. They'll never really go out of style. Right? Light. Hmm. I know I mentioned the LED strips, you know. Lighting is an important thing, but also natural lighting. You know, for years, old studios say, you know, you can't have a window in a studio. If you look at pictures of these old studios, they never had windows in them. Why? Uh, uh, sound isolation. <coughs> totally untrue. You can absolutely have a window, right? You can sound isolate that window. Imagine that. Imagine you're gonna go in a studio with no windows. You put a plant in that studio, it's gonna die. <laughs> Yet you're gonna be in a studio for 12 hours a day. How are you gonna flourish? How about we put some natural light in the space? Color. There's a, uh, you know, we can probably do a whole, you know, evening talk just on the psychology of color. There's a lot of different things. You know, one, one, here's one thing that offends me. I'm, I know you've run across this too. Oh, yeah. You got a client, and you know they're gonna start picking the finish, and they really like their logo. Yeah. <laughs> and the colors in the logo. Let's make the room the same. No. no. <laughs> do you want to live in your logo? Like, that logo looks good on a piece of paper. I don't want to live inside that. I don't want to work inside that. You don't be bound by your brand. Nobody does that, except a few people. <laughs> Tactility, right? These are all certain things, like how surfaces feel. Like I can tell you what, you go up to a door with a mortise lock and a nice door hardware, you, you grab that door, you open it, and I'll... You don't even realize it, but the, just the quality of that do door handle imparted something to you in terms of your sense of what you're gonna expect in that space. If you put a cheap door handle in there, it's just, you may not notice it, but it doesn't have that same kind of impression, right? 
the tactility of that informed you. Smell. I'm talking about good smells. Yeah. <laughs> or enough or ventilation. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, sound. All of these things, you know, fall in this realm of what we now know, you know, multimodal perception. Have you ever heard about that? Can I give you some examples? All of your senses form your perception. They all combine to form your perception. Don't step anywhere near that. <laughs> um, here's, a, here's an example. They have cupcakes, and they serve it to people. They serve the people a cupcake on a white plate, and they serve them the same cupcake on a black plate. And people report that you know the cupcake on the white plate tasted sweeter. Because what they were seeing in, changed the way they perceived the taste. Now, in this experiment, they also played high-pitched music while people were eating the cupcake off the black plate, and when they played high-pitched music, the cupcake on the black plate would taste as sweet as the one on the white cake. Because now what they were hearing, combined with what they're seeing, changed how they perceived the taste. Hmm. They did another one where they this neutral room and gave people a monitor, two dials, and they say, just dial in a neutral gray on the monitor. And then they put a citrus smell in the room and their neutral gray would lean towards the yellow. Because <laughs> what they're smelling is how they're changing what they're seeing. If they put like a coffee smell in, it would change more to kind of the brown, warmer grays. <laughs> because just changing how they're perceiving stuff. Right, so this is an important thing in everything that we do, but particularly in studios, you know. Let me give you an example. Let's say you went into a technically perfect studio that didn't look very good. Your bias would automatically assume, oh, it, it doesn't sound as good as it should because what you're seeing isn't informing, you know, it's informing what you're hearing. Let's say you went into a beautiful studio that wasn't maybe as technically as good. Your perception would think it actually sounds better than it does, yeah. right? You assign a value to it. So, it's just kind of interesting thing. That's like a lot of research being done in this area now. Um, I find it fascinating. What can we learn from it? Well, we gotta start thinking about it. Um, couple of thoughts. Bernard Schumi, you know, architect, architectural theorist. The ultimate pleasure of design is that impossible moment when an architectural act brought to excess reveals both the traces of reason and the immediate experience of space. Just makes sense. Hmm, okay. Again, leaning into the phenomenology of the studio. When I talk about phenomenology, is that that feeling when you walk in that space, how that space makes you feel. The place is not so simple as its locality, but it consists of concrete things which have material substance, shape, texture color, and together coalesce to form the environment's character or atmosphere. And then, last but not least, recording studios are not always in the background, nor environmental in character, as they call attention to themselves throughout the recording process. Uh, imagine you are a talented musician. You don't care anything about recording studios. Okay? You care about performing music. That's what your passion is and you're exceptionally good at. So you, go, you have to now go to a recording studio. So you're going to this foreign environment which is dominated with technology. So if you're not used to that, that's an intimidating environment. Is that a, a, a proper environment for that artist? And think about it. You know, we have the studio, we have the control room. Does that artist go to the studio to be controlled? No, but that's what that implies. You know, throughout the evolution of studio design, it's all been kind of driven by technical dogma. You know, describing, you know, achieving these technical requirements with very little thought given to what the purpose of the studio is. It's a workplace of the artist, right? 
Our job is to make that artist feel great in that space. That's the first number one job. Everything else can disappear and be there, but it shouldn't get in the way. Right? That's what studio design is about. You know, and we're not always successful at that, but that's the journey. That's what you're trying to do. Uh, I have a couple of examples of some uh, home studios. This is a little home studio we did in a single car garage in uh, Montreal. Single car garage. We did a little addition of the back to drop a little control room in. That's the single car garage right there. And this is the entrance to the house. Can I build a studio in a single car garage? You can say to yourself, yes. Um, <laughs> this is another one, this is in Pickering. This is a studio we designed for a gentleman, and then uh, like he built it himself over two years, and two years later, somebody thinks, well, did a pretty good job. <laughs> Single room. This is the one we uh, just finished uh, outside of Boston. This, this is a little more, this is you know, where you're crossing over from a home studio to actually full-blown professional studio. This was an addition done to his house. It's a pretty big, fully isolated light room, fully isolated control room, isolated booth machine room. You know, just off the pool area. Everybody needs that. <laughs> this one we built uh, under a garage in Intermere, BC. For a client. It's all concrete, concrete surfaces everywhere. So then all the acoustic treatment or just all additive elements on top of that finished concrete surface. This is uh, one we did in Toronto for a client. Modest control room, fully isolated. We isolated the basement area down here too. And this was kind of like you see a little home theater set up, but the screen drops up. This is actually the live room for the control room, so you can do live recording here. It's also set up if you want to do like, you know, impromptu performances with, you know, stage lighting and everything. Everybody's got to have that. Oh. <laughs> Let's retire to the family room. Um, this is a small addition we did to a house in Miami for Gustavo Salas. He's a Latin music uh, engineer, mix engineer for Shakira. People like that. This one we did in Pennsylvania. This is a, like a two and a half car garage. Part of the side of the house, we dropped in the control room, live room, little entrance area. Reasonably well isolated, not crazy, but very functional. Natural light coming in wherever we can grab it. This one is, you know, leaning more towards the professional studio. This is a basement, in a basement studio. This particular client built this in his basement. Mind you, blasted the basement out of 20 feet of granite in Aspen. <laughs> and then we put in an ISO control room, studio, ISO. It's home studio, though. <laughs> this one was built in Toronto. Uh, a little control room, a little music room. It's kind of a combination of a family room, music room, kind of carved into a new studio space. In this. this one is a little electronic music composition suite. This is built for Dead Mouse. This was the master bedroom of the house when we bought it. So we bought this house in Campbellville. So oh, let's make the studio in the master bedroom. Okay. So a master bedroom fits in here. And then these used to be closets. Now there's an ISO booth and machine room in the back. <laughs> and right across the hall over there, we're just finishing this little uh, modular lab. He's got a lot of synthesizers, so. Yes, this is a room we did in Portland for uh, Damian Lillard. Because every basketball player should have their own recording studio. <laughs> Are those LEDs? This is in his house in Portland. Uh, house is done, studio's done. He, he's no, not in uh, Portland anymore. <laughs> this, is a, this is a room we did for Fernando Garibay in Los Angeles. He's a 
Lady Gaga producer, but he like have these massive monitors and he cranks them up way too loud and that's kind of his method of work. So this is where you're sitting. I look at that Augsburger system. It's a little embarrassing actually. Um, let's put this let's put this in the living room right under the master bedroom. So this needed to have a ridiculous amount of sound isolation so that uh, you know two in the morning he's cranking it up he's not you know shaking the house and waking everybody up so this was more of a problem of dealing with the sound isolation and just being able to fit the speakers in the room um, this is a room we did for uh, Beyonce and Jay-Z if you can believe it it's right in this part of their house in Bel Air the speakers built into the glass wall in the front. That's all I can say about that. And then we did another studio for them in uh, the Hamptons. So that studio is in the basement area of that house. And this is one we just finished in Pickering for Boy Wanda. This is that little dryer arm you saw, that smaller control room. That's his uh, functional workspace. And here, you know, these guys, if you even know this at Beyonce Studio, you don't see any consoles in there. Right? Mm -hmm. They're working on laptops, a little bit of stuff to record some vocals. It's almost all entirely in the box. That's how a lot of popular music gets done. Yeah. Uh, so here, no console. We have this desk so he can sit here with his collaborators and, you know, have the monitor system. It's got an Atmos system that drops in there too. But that's how, you know, you make modern music. That's all I got to say about it. Sorry. We're done. <laughs> Carol, uh, let's take a five minute bio break. Uh, I don't think we'll. Modern networking. You don't have business cards anymore. So everything gets. Everything gets. Okay. Wow. This is. Wasn't Martin's presentation just beyond? Oh, God. Yeah. I mean, I felt like I was back yeah, at Dalhousie Physics getting, you know, getting training in acoustics and vibration. And he made it so pragmatic. And I'm just so grateful, Martin. You're, you're brilliant. Um, you'll notice that we have uh, Mr. Terry Medwedick here with us. And I would like to just briefly introduce you to Terry. Obviously, Terry and Martin are close friends, longtime colleagues. Um, Terry heads up Group One Acoustics, and he also does uh, very much the same type of work that, that Martin does. And um, what I have noticed, just looking at everything that this man has done across Canada, I can say that his unique fingerprint of sound quality is upon every important location in every province in this country. He has, he has touched and made a difference in professional recording studios, radio and TV broadcast, including CBC, uh, film, mixing and post audio, and he has a passion for doing private home studios for recording artists, musical artists, people like me, people like Alex Lifeson and Getty Lee. Um, so I really want for you to enjoy having Terry here with us because he is also going to help me out uh, with bringing all of you into the experience of recording studio, recording production. However, you all plan to do with it what you need to do. Um, I'm just gonna, just show of hands, how many people have a studio that they call their own that they're working out of right now to whatever capacity? Who's making it work? Fabulous. And how many of you are working out of your home? Great. 
And for all of you that are working out of your home, how much can you tell me flexibility matters more than anything? Just to be able to get done what you need to do. I have to. So for my whole life, I explained this to Terry on the phone, um, you know, living with family and cats and all of this. Uh, my piano and my vocal recording system has always needed to be in one part of the house and then in the box, uh, post-production, digital, uh, needs to be in a separate, different place. So I've got um, SD cards and USB sticks, you know, flying back and forth uh, between places. I have to work when the kitchen is closed. I have to be able to do what I, whatever I need to be able to do when I can do it. Um, this studio build now is happening and I'm almost, I'm terrified. I'm terrified and I'm shocked by the whole experience at how much planning, the learning curve that is required, but getting to talk with Martin and getting to talk with Terry leading up to, to this evening's experience has grounded me so well. It has given me so much clarity, hope, positivity, for the experience of nurturing your own work, whatever it is that you need to do to honor it, to respect it, to clarify it. And I think it really speaks to what Martin spoke about in his talk. Who is your studio for? What is the nature of your work? Um, are you clear on your scope? Are you clear on your capacity, your capability, your ability to network. You, you're not gonna be doing this in isolation. You're, you want to have a studio where you don't wanna leave, absolutely. But the beauty is that you guys are also out there. That I can get done maybe what I can do in my space, but then I know that I've got a colleague in Mississauga. I've got someone over here. I've got someone over there who can provide this or help with that. So for me, the idea of expanding the way that I work in terms of my workflow also means expanding with other people and working with colleagues and not isolating myself further because I have my own studio. So that was one of the things that I wanted to talk about um, <coughs> try to figure out what it is you mean to do, what it is you need to do, what it is to the degree that you want to be able to do it that you know you can. And then see your space, then see your situation, see what you have the capability and capacity to create, knowing that you're not going to be in isolation. Terry and I had, have had some beautiful conversations just in the last uh, few weeks, and he touched on a topic that was very, very close to my heart, which is making the best with what you have, doing the most with what you can, what you have available to you, and also being ready to think and create outside of the box when you understand the principles of sound, when you understand the principle of materials, um, what acoustic isolation properties of materials can be, um, then to be able to learn how various and sundry combinations will get you the lion's share close of where you can get to. And it's gonna be perfectly reasonable because you're probably already fairly flexible Anyway, these guys asked me a question. You know, the main part of your studio, it's, it's you know, 13 by 21, 22, and it's 15 feet high. You know, can you hear the rain when the rain hits the roof? Yeah, I can. <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> um, so what will you do when it rains? Well, I'll probably, um, I'll probably have to apply a gate, or I'll probably just stop recording and wait for the rain to stop. So, you know, I'm thinking in, in terms of what our space is making possible for us, and then realizing I can adapt 
I can also be flexible and I can also try to create as many genuine workarounds that'll still work for me because I've been working out of a dining room right now, you know, and I don't even have a door that closes. <laughs> so I'm kind of thinking, it, you know, keeping it all in perspective, to have a studio with a door that closes, I mean, that's just my, that's just my first, you know, surprise for me, my first surprise for me. So, yeah, there's just that amount of needing to make do. Um, so I would like to open the floor to all of you uh, for your unique scenarios, your u unique questions and concerns, <coughs> because this is the one time that you're going to have access to people like this to give you the kinds of answers that you can have. And I am happy to share what we've been trying to do in our situation. But I'm going to give that secondary tertiary consideration. I want you to be able to have your questions answered. So uh, who, would, who has a question and who would like to begin? Yes. If you're building a home studio in a, I built a previous home studio in the basement and I just did a drywall seal. Isolated, multi-layer, mass air mass. If you were to try and recreate a basement studio and you wanted the ceiling to be flexible because in a basement there's utilities for the upper levels that you need to get to, how would you approach that situation? A drop ceiling in a reinforced way with ceiling locks, like what would the, the, uh, so what was the reason for putting all the, how many, how many layers of drywall boarding do you have on the ceiling or is there an acoustic treatment jam on the bottom layer ceiling? Um, the, the previous studio I got lucky because I didn't have any utilities and I could work around it, but I've got one coming up that I want to make that is currently a drop ceiling. Oh. And the room itself is a, there's a kitchen above it. And I don't really want to. Yeah, I mean, there's two, two points, two ways of the noise control. You don't sound from yourself like the rest of the house. And, and also to uh, 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 Martin's excellent point on sound transferring via ductwork throughout the rest of the place. But you also sound from the hard floor kitchen or if there's a living room above you, you're gonna hear the clop, clop, clop. That's, that impact noise is gonna come through most ceilings. So if you do a ceiling where, what's your ceiling joist height in this case? Eight feet. Um, and, and do, you, do you have uh, cross braces in there or do you have full girts between the joists? There's cross braces. You might build, it depends on the span, but you might be able to do something if you want to, to reduce the impact noise from above. But uh, before I give you where I'm going with this, the other part of trying to avoid putting additional weight to the bottom of your joist, because I don't know how it's structured. And, and I've seen some people talk, thinking about putting heavy weights to the bottom of a joist, especially if it's in a newer home, say anything in the past, say 25 or 30 years, a lot of the joists in, the, in, the, in these houses are only designed for a certain dead load and live load capacity. And if you're gonna attach another eight, 12, or whatever pounds of added weight to the bottom of that structure, it's not gonna collapse, but it's really, in, inappropriate. So, for to, to me, an ideal way is if there's any way you can create a secondary set of joists that rest on an interior wall. So oh, you can peel away the house, and your room still remains intact with its own <coughs> joist system. But it, the bottom of your new joist might be an inch and a half below the existing joist. But it gets tricky in dealing with the cross uh, tees or braces. Um, but if you really need to suspend something from, from the under, underneath that, I mean, you're gonna lose another, anyway, six inches. And then, never mind for sound control, but also for sound absorption. Uh, because to uh, Martin's presentation, you have these very, you're gonna have these nasty room modes. So whether you design the ceiling to be partially absorbing <coughs> at lower frequencies, uh, and, and, and uh, have some compromise in sound transmission. So within that. Well, what, what's, the, what's the span? So you have an eight foot ceiling to the joist. What's the width that we're going to make? <coughs> Just move there. I haven't measured it yet. <laughs> All parking at the moment. Um, 
My, yeah, and then the, the second part of that question is in within an access hatch is if you needed to put them within that structure, how would you then design an access hatch that could not <coughs> use the mass of that membrane, but then you remove easily for, for access? I, I would say not overbuild the rest of the area because your ha hatch is going to be your weak link. But when you remove that hatch, you're also going to are you going to be needing to remove say eight inches of insulation that you're going to stuff up there as well. But what's up there? Is it a shut off valve or a duct or what is there? That well, you the kitchen renovation decided to happen in the future in the, right. in the kitchen. You wanted to move the sink, right? And or re redo that piping right in there. And, and oh, so it's changing plumbing. Possibly, it's okay. just being able to access utilities right. that are up within the, right. the ceiling. Right. Um, Do that renovation from the top down. Yeah. Is the sink, is it, is it, we have more concern with the, the, to me, I don't know what your layout is, but I'm just gonna guess that the drain is gonna be more of a concern. Is the pipes themselves to be rerouted in another way to get to your sink? So what about the drain, is the drain directly above your room? Yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, we don't have to get too much specifics and take away questions from other people, but it was really just about sort of the ceiling and accessing devices and what has sort of happened in the past for you guys and yeah. sort of materials or construction that helped. What I've noticed with your situation is when you're working with your existing house structure, it sets all of your starting criteria for you. You know? Teresa has a question. Teresa. So, uh, hi. Hi. <laughs> My question is, I think, what the, what the, the conversation is coming out is, what is the relationship between your expertise and the professional services you need to hire, such as your architects and your structural engineers and your, your mechanical, as you're doing these renovations, and it's the studio that's prime, mm -hmm. but there's the rest of the house, there's all of the, I guess, interaction between the different professionals. How do you deal with uh, with that component so that the architect gets it if they may not be a specialist? Or do you already work with teams that are well, like already uh, a unit? What's the state of the house? Is the house completed already or? Yes, let's say it's a, you know, it's already a house and you now want to build, <laughs> but you know, you need your, your plans for the architect, for the builder, for the contractors. What is the relationship between your expertise and these professionals who don't understand um, that, the US. The don't understand part's huge because I, 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 don't, I, I can imagine Martin maybe the same, but I like to have a lot more control on a project when I'm dealing with an architect, especially, or if there's an interior designer, uh, to literally provide them all of the designs, that the, even, even getting structural into the drawings and then giving them that set of drawings for them to just work from, as opposed to putting it on their plate to take care of. Okay, so you really now, if there's a, if there's a house structural engineer, you work with that individual because they know the house. But mm -hmm. there's so many other factors to look at. I mean, the egress, is it in the basement or on another, another floor of the house? Where's the studio? I'm being theoretical. Okay. Yes. okay sorry. So, so the question is that relation. So you're saying, if I may, is that you already have everything you want for your studio and then they can take care of the rest of it around it? Is that the approach? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming the house is already completed. Yes. Okay, and then they're going into say, let's call it uh, a, a finished or unfinished basement. Yes, let's say We're that. making this up. <coughs> um, I, I, would, I would prefer to be involved in, in the design, provide all the drawings you know, work with the homeowners, they obviously need the feedback on what they want. Uh, and, and there'll be a, a, a criteria set out. Uh, and then mechanical, uh, use the mechanical engineer for the house, but you give them about a seven page spec on how the mechanical system is designed. It'll be a full package provided to them, especially if they don't know what they're doing. Because uh, you can spend months going around in circles. Martin, what about uh, your approach for? Yeah, it would be the same thing. The sooner you get involved and kind of provide at least the, the basis of design for all those things, the way smoother it goes. Uh, if you get brought into a project like later on when some of those decisions are made, some of those decisions may not be consistent with what you're trying to do. And now you're kind of going backwards and it's, uh, 
cost time cost money and can cost you know if you happen to unbuild certain things to solve problems uh, literally it, it costs you the same amount of money to build a studio property as to build it improperly it just comes down to the information you're working with right so it's absolutely pivotal but if you are building it in the lower section of, of the house and you're coming off a side door perhaps like we've dealt with this in the past getting down to the studio they would go we wanted the studio but when you walk in you realize they can't get drywall down because now that the house is completed uh, they can't, they can't get, get drywall down because it's like you're ducking your head <coughs> to get underneath the cross beam right, right, right. Uh, so how are they going to get equipment and, and never mind talent or instruments down there so it goes through a complete rethink Thank you. Oh, I'll let these guys go on. No, you go. You go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't sure. Um, you highlighted how you obviously worked on some very challenging spaces, uh, and there are additional challenges by working on uh, in small, smaller spaces because of uh, where the shorter frequency is and the presence of low frequency room modes. Um, Given the type, given the challenges that you guys have faced with those types of spaces, have you ever utilized, uh, let's say, additional low frequency uh, drivers to do any kind of uh, plane wave cancellation to remove a, a number of the room modes out of the out of the space and address those issues? I've, I've never. I've heard some people trying that, and they're looking at the theory. And they they they're trying to prove that it works, but I, I I'm. I lean more towards fundamentals. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't know enough about that in truth. Okay. I just rely on just, uh, I, I, as, as much as I dislike physics, you, you gotta work with it. Sure. Uh, sure. But I've never been involved in that sort of thing. Okay. I uh, worked with a client in uh, New York, and they were sponsored by one of these companies that made these active base systems. Right. And they had a pile of them. So we're calibrating. It. So, okay, let's bring these things in. Now it's you know, time for the magic to happen. So we started bringing them in. <clears throat> and okay, I'm having trouble seeing the uh, effect that they're having on the room response. Mm -hmm. And we were trying like several different room locations, things like that. Theoretically, it should all work great. And in the right circumstances, I'm sure you can get it to be beneficial. But my experience was... Um, no, that was all the drivers were, were driving. Yeah, these were actually these active the, uh, <laughs> low-frequency cancellation systems. The, the oh. Active low-frequency cancellation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So they, they would now, now are you, are you talking, Sorry, are you talking about active base no, uh, not absorbers? No, or, not or transducers. Not, for sound system? not quite active. Say you got a pair of subwoofers at the front of uh, the front of the room, and then you got a, uh, uh, a pair at the rear. Oh, and so you're so creating a plane wave down the, same, the room, and then you're program. canceling and inverting the signal. You're not doing any kind uh, of active yeah. thing. Well, that was kind of the idea of these active ones. They were supposed to be able to put in a position where they can do that job. Uh, it was, uh, you know, when it comes down to. Uh, What's the effective area of those things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, compared to the size of the weight front, right? That you're trying to modify, right? Um, That's also economics. Uh, I understand they're quite expensive. Yeah, no, it's just a four subwoofers with a, with an amp that's inverted and time delayed. I mean, that shouldn't be that expensive. Yeah, I think, talking, I think we're talking. I think we're talking about active uh, base yeah. uh, absorbers. Yeah, if I can call it that. Yeah, it's it's to, 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 to me, it would be active system. would be like having a microphone that hears the bass as it passes, and then it feeds a signal to the rear speakers. I'm talking about taking the exact same signal to the front two speakers, time delaying, it, yeah. inverting it, and reducing the gain of it to yeah. cancel the wave as it travels down the room to remove the longitudinal. Uh, I, I just don't know. I, <laughs> I don't know. I'm interested to see what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. I've been you should do an AF of... presentation on this. I mean, I absolutely love it because that was the this whole is topic this of my thesis. Is so you yeah, you need to do your that. test yeah. and bring it back and find your results, and I'm sure we'll yeah. all benefit. Well, we had some very interesting speaker set up, so it looks reasonable until you do a, the impulse response, and it's quite unreasonable on yeah. the chart. And it sounds horrible. There's no center image. You move your head, you don't know what you're listening to anymore. But I, I still like things to be as simple and fundamental as possible, personally. I'd love to talk more with you about it. Oh, over here in the you, you there, yes. Yes, yes. Um, so I got a, a noisy room that's mostly for audio posts, although I have a microphone where I do some Foley kind of handheld Foley stuff. So it's very noisy, like my computer's noisy, 
everything's noisy and like hum, you know, when you have the headphones on. So is really the only solution if I were to get longer wires and put all the electronics in a mach like a machine room, like a closet, or is there anything that you can do when you got everything in one room? You're good. Is there anything you can do for the noise? I'm just, what kind, of, what kind of computer do you have? Is it a small laptop? No, it's a PC, like a powerful PC. Like a desktop? A desktop PC, and like, what, what you do game design. design. How, how much, how much mic gain do you have on your effects? When you're doing your little Foley, how, how, many, how much mic gain do you have on there? Uh, a lot. <laughs> yeah. I'm using the Rhodes mainly. The Rhodes, what is it called? NTS. Like, the oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, like those are, those strategy, are Omnis. Yeah. Right? My strategy yeah. is basically to put RX on my signal chain and I take up the noise and like that. Uh, yeah. Hypercardioids get you. Yeah. Get you. Uh, long, long cables. Yeah. Long cables and hypercardioids. You don't know you need a machine room until you've had a machine room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something called Isobox. Yeah, I was just going to make yeah. these sound isolated enclosures. They're all acoustically lined, have yeah. reasonable mass, the door would seal up the front. Oh, yeah, they have that no red slime in it. And they have, you know, the air circulation going through yeah, it. So yeah, it yeah. deals with yeah. that, you know, heat loader that they will, they will quiet down your PC. Is that a good idea? Yeah. Or is it? Yeah, just sure. like, he's not just Isobox. I think yeah. It's, it's, it's a real hard. thing. Yeah. 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 But, but, but uh, look into one that where they have the fans, if they have multiple fans, see if they have ones where the fans are, uh, have slightly uh, um, staggered uh, uh, RPMs. Yeah. So they don't resonate all at the same frequency. Because mm -hmm. sometimes the fan of the ISO mm -hmm. cabin is louder than your laptop. Right. That's and when this way. desktop dies, consider a silent, consider <coughs> a silent water cool mm -hmm. for your next computer. Yeah. Sometimes you can't win. Yeah. <laughs> I'm giving you an example. Yeah. For a dead mouse's studio. Yeah. And one way excited, okay, he sent me a like picture of like New Year's Eve. I just bought this console, I bought this Rupert Neve console. Oh cool, awesome. We're gonna put this analog desk in the room. Yeah. So we're gonna design a desk that that desk is gonna sit into. And so I'm back and forth with uh, Rupert Neve in Austin, Texas, you know, about the dimensions of this console. I said, how long are the power supply cables? Because we want, we don't want any fans in the control room. I want to make sure all those power supplies are all sitting in the machine room. We've got to fire on this path. So we're going back and forth on the length of all the power supply cables. And there's separate power supply cable for every four meters on that thing and everything else. A lot of power supply cables going back. Oh, I said, well, we can, uh, if you put a resistor in line, we can cut that down in half. Right. So that's great. We dropped it by 3 dB. <laughs> Because you know they run the rail voltage at 40 volts, and if the ring runs hot, so they have all these fans in it. It's, like, yeah. it's for fans of Rupert Neal. And then the back of it was I'm not going to be here all night. Uh, hats in the back. Okay. Um, over the last five, 10, 15, 20 years, how have you know budgets changed? How have challenges changed? How have, uh, has technology changed or improved or made what you do harder? Uh, budgets. I'm not going to say who, but I've got a couple of clients who have built facilities, only clients have built facilities, but, but two in particular built facilities about 10, 12 years ago. And in their minds, it's still $400 a square foot. And it's not that. Um, and you, and you really have to uh, convince them. But their business plan said they can only go to a certain amount, uh, maybe 50%, 60% higher than that. And it's, it's their business plan. They got to stick to it. So that's I mean, just your budget point. Um, we're having to focus on just the fundamentals of the room. They're not going to look spectacular. If anything's left, they'll put some frilly things up. I don't get Bohemian with some particular fabrics or put some uh, Jimi Hendrix posters up, I don't know. <laughs> but to, to Martin's presentation about the aesthetics, form and function, and you want to be able to go into that room, it's still being fresh six, eight months, ten, five years later. Uh, some rooms don't have that ability because of their budget. They can, they can add more lipstick as they go with the budget. You know, money comes in, but 
to me, the budget is, uh, if the room doesn't function, if it doesn't work, if they have to uh, shut the air off to function, or they can't operate during rush hours, the street cars are too loud, that's, it's really bad. Uh, and I apologize, what were the other parts? Uh, technology. Oh. Martin, did you wanna do something about the budget, or? Yeah, budget. I tell you, we had, we had this one project in New York. It's going to be our cool studio. It was, we were going to start construction before the pandemic. It was a two and a half million dollar build. And then we paused the construction. And then after uh, we decided to restart the construction, that same project was four million dollars. Changes that fast. Yeah. Now, one thing though, uh, if you if you have a home studio and you have and you're uh, and handy with <coughs> tools and you don't mind, you know, getting a little sweat and you can work. Uh, one thing that I remind people of doing home studios, to me, 70, about 65, 70% of, of your construction budget is labor. So if you, the more you can do yourself, uh, that's, what, that's a way to save money. Uh, it, it may not be as professional as if it was a, a professional contractor, uh, but it depends what you're doing. Noise, is it noise control also, interior acoustics alone? What, what is it? Well, just, uh, you know, how have things changed? Uh, yeah. You know, technology, has, has technology, has, you know, computer design or, or uh, don't be dark or whatever. Oh, uh, okay. Made things faster and a smoother process uh, <clears throat> versus, you know, the cost of lumber or something, which is, it's made things harder. Well, I think yeah. for guys like us, software certainly helped. I think both of us in the early years were using little Texas Instrument pocket calculators. And, <laughs> <H -P> going, <laughs> and a lot of HP pencils and colors and things of that nature. But now it's, by now, I think we, I think we know what we're doing. Though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but there are, you know what, like, there are so many, uh, for, for people who say, well, can't really afford to hire a consultant to help them out. There's a lot of DIY uh, uh, things online. You know, just go to YouTube or a lot of these, just type in um, acoustic software free or something and you'd be surprised what comes up. On this webpage, I have a section called free resources and we'll be there just going to be added to that. So, so my question is, okay, so uh, I'm a fan of your art, a fan of both your arts, I, I've done studios with both of you. Uh, can I just buy, like, designs? Can I just, like, go to, like, you know, like, get, a, get a haircut done and want uh, that one. Like, how, like, can I just come to you and say, I'd like this one and buy the package from Mert Kushner, but without the stamp, or Terry, without the stamp? Like, how can we, you know, consume some of your drawings and inspiration as, Clients, but not clients. Yeah, uh, Tom Hidley used to do that. Oh, yeah, yes, then, exactly. uh, Tom Hidley studio. Everybody had the same studio. They just changed the name on the drawing. Yeah. You see hundred thousand dollars for this <coughs> set of plans. But, uh, problem is, you know, recycling plans is not a good idea because everything baked into that plan is driven by the context of where it was originally designed. Yeah. And just reusing something is not a good idea. I've gotten phone calls from people asking questions about drawings where somehow they got a set of old drawings and they were building an old studio we designed somewhere else and some completely, like, wait, wait, what? This makes no sense. At one Liberty Village, I think you ran into. Some, and somebody got a hold of Martin's drawings and started building a place. Bootleg, bootleg drawings. Dark web. 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 Dark web.
and they hired a fellow out of New York, I won't mention who, and he <laughs> sold he sold them a set of drawings, and it wasn't until they started doing demolition, and realized, well, these drawings aren't aid for this facility and they don't fit. Well, they will they take the roof up another you know, five or six feet, so they had to rescale and completely redesign everything. And then there's the aspect of if you buy a stock set of drawings, that individual's name follows those drawings. Even if, you know, I mean, you, 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 do, you build them faithfully, if, if something goes quite right with the ceilings and a foot lower than what the drawings show. Yeah. They don't want their name on Yeah. For yours. That's such a good point. I, I, I appreciate hearing that. Oh, and more questions. I'm not, she's in charge. No. Hi, quick question. Do you have trouble with contractors who don't follow your design details? Maybe because I've built yeah. data centers and long-term care facilities and drywallers, even with resilient channels, said, oh, look what I've done. And they screw through the resilient channel and into oh, the joist because that got it really strong for you now. They just don't understand, right? Yeah, I, I feel like going to church every time I hear a contractor saying they actually have drawings on site. Uh -huh. so, so what you, I'm saying, they, they don't, some, you're, uh, a subcontractor is calling you, which they shouldn't be calling you. It should be through you know, the uh, project manager on site. Uh, but they don't look at the drawings. There's always somebody who comes in in the morning and tells them what to do. Yes. But to your point, I stopped uh, specifying um, uh, uh, excellent product. Uh, it's a, a hanger. It's a, a, for fur and channels for, 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 for ply tech. So it's got a rubber grommet on it, a couple of clips, and you run a fern channel through, and that's screwed on to framing. Mm -hmm. uh, usually for single partitions, and it, it, it does a wonderful job if installed properly. Mm -hmm. Contractors who don't read the drawings, don't look at the instructions, and somebody's just handed a box of these and told to screw them up, yeah. will torque them so tight that the rubber grommet squashes to nothing. Uh -huh. And don't even, and then you don't, and they'll realize when they put the furring channel on, they don't even line up because one's torqued more than the other. So mm -hmm. it, it's 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 an issue, and this is where I think I I, I uh, my blood pressure certainly goes up going to certain job sites, knowing this is going to be a, a, what's typically a one hour visit is going to be three, and then another two and a half hours of deficiency lists. Yeah, because yeah, some of them mean well, but they just don't look at the detail, they don't read your specifications. Well, especially if they're, again, it's just myself, if they're a residential contract and they think somebody told us wrong, then they don't get it. You know, they didn't ask the questions, the appropriate questions in the beginning, and at the same time, some of them are not guilty because they were only handed drawings in the previous week and they mm -hmm. weren't part of the startup meeting. Yeah. yeah. So I forgive that, but uh, if somebody didn't look at the drawings, especially when they priced them out, how do they price them? Mm -hmm. You know, they, and they, I'm always suspicious during the either tender stage or the pricing stage, and you don't get one call or one question. Yeah. No matter how good the drawings are detailed, you get one, one, not one question. I know it's going to be a bad road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the key thing is, you know, you got this pretty complex set of drawings. It's absolutely imperative that you indoctrinate the contractor. Basically, you're running through all the details on drawing. You explain why those details are different and necessary, mm -hmm. and there's no, you know, like, ability to deviate from that. And like Terry says, big red flag. If you got a contractor building a project and it doesn't call you, it means they didn't read the drawings. Yeah. yeah. And they just making assumptions and moving ahead, and mm -hmm. that is always a disaster. I, I like the ones where they call you and they go, if, if if this, if we did this. Would that be okay? You can replace because they were yeah. half inch instead of five eighths, five mm -hmm. eight or something. Uh, and and then you, you you go well, did you build it already? And they go well, would it be okay? I find some contractors they they uh, they do listen, they do pay attention, but at some point once your subs get rolling, they get back into their way of doing things. They don't put the uh, screws where they're supposed to. Uh, the, the nightmare for me is going on job sites and they're cheering because they actually hit a stud. Yeah. You know, that sort of thing. Or in multiple boarding layers, the all the layers get sealed, be it caulking, mm -hmm. prior to the last layer of drywall. <coughs> so say if there's two layers of drywall, the first one that goes on 
is uh, the gaps are filled, caulking, mud, whatever they can use, you just don't leave the gaps there. Mm -hmm. Because a finishing contractor will go with you. Who's going to see it? That's the way they look at it. They don't think they educate them on what's, how right. sounds actually right. going to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it's, it's an education for as, some of them. As a residential homeowner, if you're making structural <coughs> changes to your home, all of these things are under the purview of inspection. Mm -hmm. And you have to know who your inspector is. Yeah. Because they're going to come in and they're going to see those kinds of isolation clips. They're going to see those kinds of things and they're going to say, take that out. Yeah. Take they, that out. They think you're getting more heat loss transfer or something. Or, or it. it's structurally unsound mm -hmm. and we don't do it this way. So you're really going to hit problems at all different levels. Yeah. And to answer uh, our friend's question at the back, this is the kind of stuff where the level of research, it just keeps dropping deeper and deeper mm. and deeper into the layers of how much is involved. Yeah. And you, as the homeowner or the musical artist or the recording engineer, you have a say. But so do they. And so does your structural engineer. And so does county. <laughs> and so before you know it, you're hitting all of these blocks because they won't agree. Mm -hmm. They won't agree to what they'll let you do. Yeah. And then you do it, and they come in, and they say, take it out. Mm -hmm. So that's a problem. Last question. Last okay. question. Yeah, we're getting kicked out. Yeah, I, I have a question about yeah. the vocal booth. Yeah. Uh, if you want to build a vocal booth in your like, uh, uh, open space, uh, like a studio, and then the, uh, uh, probably you have two options. One is like you build it by yourself, right? And another one is buy a portable one. So, which one is better? And uh, <laughs> you, you spend a lot of money on a portable booth. You know, you get like a winger booth, like be like it's a, for the portable booth. Like you know, like uh, I, I search on the website. There's a lot of company who doing this kind of thing. Like like if you guys have some like recommendation, like I would like to know. Yeah, about because it's very convenient, there, right? If you're some, moving, just move it up. Yeah, oh, there are yeah. some better ones, and uh, there are a lot of like a lot of not good ones. I have some clients actually suing these companies for providing them an ice but it didn't actually even work properly, right? Uh -huh. it sounds like a box and has no sound isolation. Yeah, not really what you're looking for in an ISO booth. And you know, really, you could if you're handy, okay, like Terry says, okay, you know, with the right kind of approach, you can you know build it for probably the same money. Okay. And um, when you're in these small spaces, uh -huh. you need to have an exceptional amount of sound absorption in them. For more fun with a box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and easier in a bigger space. Uh -huh. And a really interesting thing about some of the more attractive booths that are out there really are just that. They're, they're very attractive. They uh -huh. don't stop a lot of sound going in or out. Uh -huh. uh, but and if you started to cover them, say, with layers of uh, lint mass, bare rubber or something to increase, uh, so the person inside isn't, uh, pick, the microphone isn't picking up outside things. Yeah. You also have to add something to the door. Uh -huh. Now what you're doing, again, to Mark's point on the mass law, you're now cocooning that room more. So mm -hmm. the sound that would have gotten out, say, if, there, if it's a deep voice, Part of that's getting out. It's now contained. Yeah. So not only are you adding more materials to the outside, mm -hmm. you're adding a thicker acoustic treatment on the inside. Yeah, yeah. So if you get a really attractive booth, mm -hmm. you're gonna have to do a lot of work to it, depending on your criteria, depending on what makes you happy. Like, like most I, things for the like soundproof, like because because yeah. the outside of the noise is like a, it's not like a uh, industry level. So if you want to make the like a uh, higher quality. Uh, yeah. Sound. It's not just that you buy a better microphone, right? right. So you have to treat the like. Uh, but get, but get a booth that's larger because in a small booth, Martin was saying your, your voice just builds up in your mm -hmm. and whatever you whatever you put in that booth is just going to sound like a beach ball. Okay. So so you don't want that unless you like that. Mm -hmm. uh, the Wenger booths. I mean, your, your minimum size that you want. Uh, I mean, Humber College has quite a few of them. They're like six by eight. Is no. one of the smallest one. Those they sound pretty reasonable. Uh -huh. uh, if installed correctly, they do work well. Okay. But I know this might make some people cringe if aesthetics is really high up on your <coughs> list. But there's a company called Echo. I think they're in Cornwall. Uh -huh. They make industrial booths for work for factories. Yeah. And so they need to take factory noise that might be. S 
steam compressors, heavy yeah. machinery oh. at, at, at ridiculously low levels and bring that down to a normal level inside the enclosure. They, they look atrocious, mm -hmm. but that's where fabric and some paint and, and some other things could, could, could work out. So yeah. it's, a, it's a balance of how important. And wow. But you need it collapsible. That's the reason you're getting a booth is that in five years from now, you can just collapse it and take it with you. You're looking for a collapsible booth? Uh, like, so I just, uh, like, because the situation is like, I have a uh, like home studio, uh, uh, like in my basement. Uh, like uh, right now, just making uh, music. So uh, I'm a composer, like, uh, like do, doing like uh, creative things. And uh, uh, I really want to to build up uh, like vocal booths because it's very convenient. Uh, like uh, if I want to recording something, it's for me it's very convenient. Just to ask the uh, singer come over, just recording. But the situation is like if uh, if the, the like uh, the, the 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 vocalist uh, like recording just beside my computer, and uh, the the microphone can pick up a lot of the you know the computer noise. Mm, probably the uh, finance the noise some like a uh, air condition noise yeah. so like I would like to think about to build up a uh, like a, a four by six or four by six by six that this kind of like the vocal boost to to recording the vocal yeah. what, uh -huh. do you have what do you have a spare room in the house that you can put the vocal in like another bedroom that you might be able to use as your booth? Uh, I have a the, yeah, like a walk a in the washroom walk-in closet <laughs> walk-in closet walk 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 one of my favorite examples of making it work <laughs> and we, we talked about yeah, Alanis Al 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 Morissette's <laughs> album uh -huh. uh, Jagged Little Pill yeah. it, it did reasonably well yeah. Uh, and apparently that was done as a, as a demo, I, I understand, yeah. and it was just in, a, in the producer's uh -huh. condo or house, house with, yeah. with, with mattresses against the wall. Okay. So, check, yeah, check out your bathroom too. Yeah. <laughs> walk in, walk in closets. With <laughs> walk, okay. You know, with it's the closets. It's, 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 it's yeah, lots of clothes. Yeah, yeah. lots of clothes. Yeah, lots of clothes. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of free of charge. Yeah. 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 You could improvise something. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, or even in a corner again, maybe using the moat, the, the mattress idea, creating like a, a corner of the room, and yeah. like how long is the vocals going to be in there for? Not six hours. No. Yeah. So, but it should, it should. Sorry, it should be noted. I, I just can't. This. <laughs> it's the thing about recording of vocals, the vocal is incredibly close to the microphone. Yeah. The actual signal to noise ratio that you need is not really what you, if you can hear a little noise in the room, it's not really going to affect the vocal recording you that much when the singer stays that close to the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. just, because of, just because of the super <clears throat> square line. Yeah. Just because of close micing, close micing will get yeah, you along. That's your friend. In yeah, it is your friend. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what, what I do for now, just like, as <laughs> yeah. close as to the microphone. Like. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's, not, that's not wrong. So in other yeah. words, the, a reasonable amount of isolation uh -huh. will get you pretty far. Yeah, yeah. I really will. Need an we've even seen of, we've even uh, seen uh, Jeff putting those yeah. backing boards. You know, just those backing yeah, that's, boards. Yeah, that's okay. Okay. It's a hold down on some of those. Like right now, I have the like uh, the the microphone boots, something like that. Okay, we are we are over time. We're going to over end up overstaying our welcome. I'd like to thank Jeff for getting us this room. Thank you, Mr. Wolfer. I want to thank Martin Pilcher for taking time out of his busy global jet set lifestyle. And I want to thank Terry for co-hosting this wonderful panel with me. I really appreciate it. Um, anybody who would like to know more about what a residential homeowner is making happen with consulting advice, and coordinating your contractor, your electrician, all of that stuff. You can contact me through the studio, you can contact me through AES, and I'm happy to talk about any questions that you might have from a humble homeowner's perspective. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming, and um, I hope this evening provides inspiration for all of you to do more. Leave the chairs, take some pizza. Yeah.